this section of notes, we're going to be looking at the culture, Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia today. With the culture, we're going to look at the diversity of the culture. We're going to look at the languages, the religions, and then how you can see the culture and the actual architecture. Within Southeast Asia today, we're going to look at agriculture and their focus on rice cultivation and then as well as the other crops. And then we'll look at industry, uh, how these countries are either in industrialized or industrializing. Uh, we're going to look at some of the less developed countries, what they need to do to improve the interdependence of the area. Uh, and then we'll look at the nature and the human environment interaction with nature uh, and see how nature's might has affected the people. Culture of Southeast Asia. Cultural diversity. First thing I want to look at within this is languages. Most of the region's languages stem from three major language families. The Malayo-Polynesian, sino tibetan and the mon Khmer families. Many languages are the result of migration or colonization. For example, in the Philippines, you have English, Spanish, and Filipino spoken even though this map does not give you the best representation um, of those specific ones. In Malaysia, English is the main language because the UK's dominance in this region. And then you look at some of these other areas. Thai is a big portion of the mainland uh, within the simo tibetan language family. You've got Burmese in the west, and you've got other that they're putting here. But you can see that... Um, including the Austronesian, the sino tibetan is definitely your um, most prevalent language family. Now your religions. All of the world's major religions are represented in Southeast Asia somewhere. These different religious beliefs not only coexist with each other, but they also mingle with each other throughout Southeast Asia. And what I mean by that is you have a lot of blending going on of these different um, religions. In Vietnam, for example, people b blend Buddhism, Confucianism, and Catholicism based on where you're located and where these influences came across. You can see, for the most part, the most dominant religion of this region is Islam. Definitely where the Muslim traders came into these coastal areas. Indonesia is one of the world's largest percentages of the population that worships Islam. But you've also got some Roman Catholic where the Spanish conquered the Philippines. And then you have some of the Chinese religions, which we talked about a lot of that was shamanism and those sorts of things. We've got a section of the traditional religions, uh, religions of the, the peoples themselves. And then you've got Buddhist regions, depending on the Indians that came in and traded um, from India with this region. And then again, some pockets of traditional religions based on some of the indigenous peoples that are still um, in the majority of these countries. And then architecture. You can actually see what culture dominates a society based on their agriculture, or their architecture, I'm sorry. For example, you've got elaborate Chinese-style pagodas in a lot of this region, like you see in the, in the northwest. And if China dominated that area, then you're going to see a lot of these types of architecture with the pagodas. You're also going to see the Indian-style wats like we see in the top right corner. A wat, that is a temple, um, an Indian type of temple, and these dot the landscape. This one is the Angkor Wat, um, which we talked about with the Khmer region. And you've also got Buddhist shrines in this area. I don't have a picture of that, but if Buddhism was introduced in the area, then you have that. In Malaysia, for example, in Indonesia, you're going to see... Um, Islamic mosques. And this one is actually the crystal mosque of Malaysia um, where Islam is practiced. But you can see that part of this bu these buildings are actually made out of crystal. Um, pretty cool. And then in the Philippines, you're going to see a lot of Roman Catholic type churches like we see uh, in the picture in the bottom right. So you can see the culture through the architecture of the buildings. And now for lack of a better place to put this, I want to talk about Singapore. Singapore is an island nation. It has a lot of smaller islands, like you can see in the map in the top here. But it has one main island where the city of Singapore is actually located. Um, and that's pretty much what makes up the Singapore island itself. Um, but Singapore is an international port city. Now, one thing I want to uh, point out to you is that Singapore connects trade across the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. They have a port Freeport zone where they don't charge anything for people to, to leave their goods for a little while. They don't have 
um, fees that they make people pay. And because of this, trade is influenced in this area. Also because trade is influenced in this area, this is a hub for cultural diffusion. And what I mean by that is a lot of people are coming into Singapore and leaving Singapore based off of trade. And so culture is able to come in and leave Singapore like crazy. And so it is a hub for getting Southeast Asian culture out into other areas because so many people are coming into Singapore. And the city itself, we've got a picture here in the bottom, kind of one of the iconic images from Singapore, is very developed and it's very pretty. Um, it's a tourist place. Their architecture, you can kind of see the culture and the architecture um, and some of the more modern types of construction. Um, pretty neat city. Agriculture, rice cultivation. For 2,000 years, the Ifigua people of the Philippines have worked their fields um, and they followed the contours of the mountains to terrace their fields and terrace their landscape so that they can create more rice. Flooded rivers and abundant rainfall have provided a lot of water in Southeast Asia which is perfect for rice growing um, a rice growing area. In parts of Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, seasonal flooding of the Chao Phraya and the Mekong rivers irrigates paddies or flooded fields in which rice is grown. Rain also provides enough water to grow rice in the Irrawaddy, Irrawaddy River Delta in Myanmar and in other parts of the Philippines. Rice growing can be hard work as most don't have modern machines. They plant and harvest their crops by hand, and they use simple tools such as sickles, which are long, sharp, curved knives. And I've got a picture here of a rice paddy um, that I wanted to point out to you. Um, this rice paddy, uh, it's actually a modification to the environment. You can see kind of as an overhead view um, the roads that are going through here. Um, but people have modified their environment and created these paddies here to trap the water so that you can have the marshy environment needed to grow rice. Some of the other crops, cassava, yams, corn, bananas, and other food crops are found when it's too dry for rice. Many families have small subsistence plots that produce a variety of vegetables, and some people also raise pigs and poultry for food. Plantations in coastal lowlands provide many cash crops, and one of the most important cash crops of the region is rubber. Indonesia, because of its location between the equator and Tropic of Capricorn, has a lot of forests, timber industry is big, and because of that, deforestation is occurring here um, pretty much more than anywhere else in the world. Industry. Industry is rapidly growing in the region throughout much of these countries. Singapore and Malaysia are two good examples of this. Singapore has regions that are mostly developed. Their economy is mostly developed. Its location and its harbors make it a major port and manufacturing center as well as a cultural hub like we learned about in the culture unit. Malaysia remains one of the major producers of natural rubber and palm oil, but now they also focus on manufacturing. They've become one of the world's largest exporters of microchips, and that is making their country more developed. And then we move on to more of the less developed countries. Rapid population growth and inadequate transportation have hurt Vietnam's economic development. The country, however, has a large potential workforce. It has coastlines and it has potential for tourism, but it hasn't been taken advantage of just yet. So Vietnam is a less developed country. Cambodia is also a less developed country. Cambodia's economy suffers from outdated factories and the lack of a trained, experienced workforce. And Myanmar is also an example of a less developed country. Myanmar's self-imposed isolation from the world's market has slowed its economic growth. They wanted to isolate themselves from everybody else, and that's created a bad situation in Myanmar as they are not able to grow economically. Interdependence. In recent years, Southeast Asian countries have become more interdependent 
which means reliant on one another. These nations are starting to globalize and the association of Southeast Asian nations, also known as Asian, is helping that globalization. Member nations agree for a free trade zone, meaning that you can trade freely within the member countries which are listed on this map, which is most of Southeast Asia. Transportation. Today, most shipping between Europe and East Asia goes through a choke point known as the Strait of Malacca. You can see that pointed out here, in between Malaysia and Indonesia. This enables Singapore, located here, to prosper because most of the shipping coming from the, the Western world comes through this Strait of Malacca, and then they wind up in Singapore, which helps fuel their economy. Singapore has become a free port, meaning a place where goods can be unloaded, stored, and reshipped free of import duty. Sea trade is vital for all of the countries of Southeast Asia. Communications. Singapore is one of the most developed countries in this nation, and their communications are one of the most developed. Rural dwellers within Southeast Asia have little access to newspapers, televisions, or the internet, but in the cities, these are plentiful. Nature's might. Volcanoes. Like we talked about in the earlier section of notes, there are a lot of volcanoes in this region. The Indonesian island of Bali is famous for a volcano that reaches 10,308 feet high, and that volcano is called Gunung Agung. There's a lot of volcanoes in this region. This map shows you the historical eruptions um, from volcanoes, and you can see all of the red triangles and how highly active the tectonic activities in this area are. Floods and typhoons. Human activity often magnifies the effects of floods in this region. For example, 1991 through 1995, the Philippines, because of deforestation, suffered massive runoffs and massive mudslides. Also, cyclones are known to occur in this region, as well as typhoons, which we talked about typhoons being similar to hurricanes. They just occur uh, in the Pacific Ocean. But flooding is frequent in these areas, and you can see how people have modified, uh, have adapted, well, actually modified their landscape to live. You can see these houses here um, are actually built on stilts because you've got the water level here, uh, and you actually see them with, with boats here um, coming up to those houses.